We thank you for your long suffering. We thank you for your protection. Father, we just ask now that as we are assembled together, that you just do what you always do, that you reveal yourself to us through your word, that you help us to understand who we are through your word. This morning, Father, we pray for those who need a touch. We pray for those who need healing. We pray for those who need deliverance. Lord, we ask you to touch, heal, and deliver like only you can. We ask special blessings for those who wanted to be here today but are unable for whatever reason. Lord, we ask you to fix the situation. We ask you to fix the problem. We ask you to touch bodies. We ask you to mend hearts. We ask you to lift up heads this morning. Those who are bereaved, Lord, we ask you to comfort them right now in the name of Jesus. All over this land and all over this country, Lord, we just ask you to continue to move in a mighty way. We thank you now. We praise you for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Bless you this morning. Bless you this morning. You know, when you're really saved, you say, bless your hearts, bless your hearts this morning. So, so I'm really saved, so I'm saying bless your hearts this morning, bless your hearts. So good to be here this morning, so good to see each one of you, and I am soliciting your prayers this morning, just, uh, just asking for prayer this morning. I want to ask for a special prayer for my brother Ralph, who is recuperating from surgery, I was telling uh, I was telling Sister Leela that Ralph had a head injury a few years ago and um, had surgery then, and um, it has continued to bother him. So a few days ago, they went in and opened up his skull cap and uh, went in to do some surgery around in there. And so we're just praying. He's my oldest brother, and uh, all of my family, they're special to me. So I'm just asking a very special prayer for, for Ralph as he's recuperating at UAMS this morning. I thank God for the people of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. It's always good to see you, and it is good that when you come, you don't have to teach to the benches, teach to the chairs, that it's someone sitting in the chairs. I don't take that lightly. I don't take it for granted because I know you could have chosen to do something else. We all have other stuff to do, don't we? Amen. Praise God. I'm looking at Brother Arthur. I know Brother Arthur. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank God for you, Brother. <laughs> Brother Arthur, no. Brother Arthur, know what I'm talking about. We just thank God for you. We're just so uh, delighted, delighted, delighted. And I'm thinking, let's pray for Sister Jean this morning. She's not well this morning. Pray for her. Keep her in your prayers. And so we're so delighted this morning. We've been in the study of Exodus. We call it the patriarchal stage. And... Um, we are just moving right along, and we are finally at this point where uh, Moses has entered the scene. Moses has entered the scene, and it was needful for him to enter because God heard the cry of his people as they were down in Egypt, heard the cry of his uh, people as they were, re they were burdened by reason of the taskmaster. There came a pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. It came a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. They had, had experienced favor. And it's something when you have had favor. Sometimes people say, you know, you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth or, or, or that, oh, you've had it all, you've had it made all your life. And it's something when you've had it made and all of a sudden hard times befall you. That's kind of what happened to the children of Israel. There came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And the people, the favor of God was on them so the people were just multiplying. The people were just multiplying. And Pharaoh says, you know, we got to deal wisely with them. We got to deal wisely with them because if we don't, they'll expand and be more than us. And if the enemy comes in, they'll side with the enemy and wipe us out. So we got to do something to see about this. And we, what they did was they made them slaves. They made them slaves. They burdened them. They were burdened them. And it made it just exceptionally hard for them because the favor of God was on them. But it's something about the favor of God that man doesn't have anything to do with it. And no matter what he does to try to stop it, God still shows himself mighty. 
That's what God continued to do even in the face of their oppression. And that's why, let me tell you this morning, that's why people don't understand how you can still smile and how you can still just exceed or, and how you can still go on with your life, how you can still seem like things are still working out for you because they don't understand the favor of God. The favor of God really is inexplicable. It's an action of God that we really try to figure it out, but who can figure it out? God said, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And so sometimes it's the one that we least expect. Sometimes it's the one, it's the most low down one that God looks like he's having favor on. I was like, how, how, how is that happening? Well, it's not for us to figure it out because it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And so as we are proceeding, we had gone through and we talked about, go ahead and turn to Exodus, the 12th chapter. And anytime this morning that you have something you want to say, if you want to hop right in, just feel free to do so. So we'd gone, uh, we'd begin to talk about the um, judgments against Egypt and the gods of Egypt. And that came in the form of plagues. And, uh, Moses had warned Pharaoh about some of the plagues that were coming and, and, and Pharaoh had an opportunity to repent and we know repent means to change your mind. He had an opportunity to repent but his heart was hardened and even after some of the plagues came when he got a little relief when he called Moses in and said you need to do something about this his heart became even more hardened. So he had an opportunity to do something different, but he didn't. And so the plagues came, and they came in the form of water, the blood, frogs, gnats, flies, death of the livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the darkness preceded the birth, or the death, rather, of the firstborn, death of the firstborn. And so this is the last plague. God has given him opportunity after opportunity to do something different, but he did not do anything different. And so he was warned. Uh, let's look at chapter 11 before we go to chapter 12. Exodus chapter 11, and let's look at verse 4. Are you there? And Moses said, thus said the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beast. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. So he's letting him know what's getting ready to happen. So don't be surprised because the, the plagues were evident that God is a God who stands by his word. God said, I'm going to do it. And he did just that. He did everything that he said he was going to do. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. And so the death then would come to visit the Egyptians and all the firstborn uh, sons and firstborn livestock in Egypt would die. And then, as the scripture has says, a great cry would be heard throughout the land. So we've already said that death would not visit the Jews and their livestock. Why? Because they belong to the Lord. 
and they were his special people. So he set them as he was going to set them aside. Um, in Goshen, as we're going to see when we began to talk about this, that the only thing that would die would be an innocent lamb. And so now we have the inauguration of what is known as the Passover. The Passover is here when we begin to talk about it in Exodus. This is the inauguration of their first national feast. So I want to know, um, and, and you can just let me know, what do you already know about the Passover from what you read this past week? What do you know about the Passover? What do, why are you laughing, Pastor? <laughs> what do you know about the Passover? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get the microphone. Let me see here. Make sure that it's on. Mm -hmm. uh, the blood. The Passover, the blood All right. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Mother Lee said the blood. blood. You can't have a Passover without talking about the blood. Can you? Uh huh. What did you, What did you read about it? Is that me? Is that me? Okay. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I tell you what to do is if I hold it, see if it works. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. All righty then. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna just talk about it then. How about that? All righty. Okay, let's go to Exodus 12. Let's go to Exodus 12. Are you there? And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Shall be unto you the beginning of months. Um, when, when you talk about a calendar in the Old Testament, for the Hebrews, there were two calendars, a civil calendar and a religious calendar. So now this beginning of month, uh, the month of Nisan, would be our probably between March and April, okay? And then they had a civil calendar, which uh, the beginning of that calendar, September, October. Have you ever heard of Rosh Hashanah? Uh, and, and usually when it's, when, when it's Rosh Hashanah, when you're around anyone who's a Jew, you wish them a happy new year it's because that's the beginning of their new year. So for the religious calendar, March and April, now we're talking about the Passover being held during that time for them. He says this will be uh, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel. So this included everybody. No one was left out of this. Saying in the tenth day of this month, thou shalt take to thee every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, um, when, when we began to talk about uh, the Exodus, them leaving Egypt. Remember there was a time when Moses spoke to, when God spoke to Abraham rather, and said that when, when the people of Israel left Egypt, that they weren't, were going to leave with great substance. Let's go back and let's look at that. Go back to Genesis, the 15th chapter. So the, now the time had come for that. Genesis 15 and 14. I, it just amazes me how God just, main, he just maintains consistency and he keeps his word. He's always faithful. He never, nothing he says he ever forgets. Nothing he just, he never forgets. He always backs up everything that he says. In uh, Genesis, the 15th chapter, he talked about the bondage of the Israelites. And let's look at verse 13. 
Let's look at um, Genesis 15 and verse 13. You have it? And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Now, let's go over to Exodus, the third chapter. We're in Exodus, the 12th chapter. Let's go to Exodus, the third chapter. And let's look at, let's look at verse 21. Exodus 3 and He's talking to Moses and telling Moses what he wants him to do and telling him, kind of giving him an outline of how things are going to happen, that uh, Pharaoh's not, uh, Pharaoh's going to harden his heart, but that he's going to continue to move. And in uh, verse 19, it says, and I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. Ye shall not go empty. And see, it, what has happened here is that... Uh, they have burdened the people for all these years because it was, a, it was a, a lot of years that they were made to work, uh, to do hard labor. And it was free labor. But now they're getting ready to get paid for what they did. They're getting ready to get paid. He says, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So now the time had come for them to do just that. So in uh, chapter 12, in chapter 12, in verse 4, we had talked about them getting a lamb according to the house of their father, in chapter 12, verse 4, it says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his father next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Somebody tell me what that means, without blemish. Okay, be spotless. No, no sickness, no, no, no disease, nothing wrong with the lamb, nothing wrong with the lamb. We can actually, um, let's see if we can find that in Leviticus. Can we go over to Leviticus? Now, I might have to look for it, but it is in Leviticus that kind of tells us that. So go over to Leviticus. Okay. And what does it say? Okay, okay. In Leviticus, you can find it in uh, Leviticus, the twenty second chapter. In this particular uh, chapter, it talks about. Uh, the offerings for the different feasts that, that you make, and it talks about what's required. Leviticus, the 22nd chapter. Leviticus, the 22nd chapter. Um, let's look at the um, 19th verse. 
Let's look at the 19th verse. Are you there? Leviticus 22 and 19. This is just give us an understanding of what it means to be unblemished. You shall offer at your own will a male without blemish of the bees of the sheep or of the goats. But whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. And whosoever offers a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. So if it's blemished, blind or broken or maimed, or having a win, that's a, an ulcer, or that's, that's like an ulcer or a, an open sore, or scurvy, or scabbed, you shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Uh, look down at verse 24. You shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised, or crushed, or broken, or cut. Neither shall ye make any offering thereof in your land. What do you think is the, is the whole, whole premise behind that? What do you think is a premise behind uh, offering uh, something that is unblemished? What I said is it's like they're a offering or sacrifice. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Jackie had something to say. Jackie. I was just saying trying to offer a perfect sacrifice to a perfect God. Okay, 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 okay. All right, okay, we're all headed we're all headed in the right direction. Anybody else? Because when Jesus comes to to redeem he was fighting. All right, okay. That's and that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because what we're gonna see and I'm undressing back here because I thought it was me, so I'm taking this off. Okay. <laughs> because what we're going to see, just turn it off, Pastor. And it does, that's not it either. That's not easy. No. It's, it's, it's uh, something to do with the system. It's something in the system. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. So we're. <laughs> okay. All right. We can use this. One. Yeah, we can. It's true. Thank you. Yeah. Just go back to the wires. It, the, with these, like like uh, someone said, uh, Sister Helen, the lamb is symbolic. Of course, the lamb is symbolic of Christ Jesus and that Christ Jesus was spotless. So then the shadow has to bear some resemblance to the true. The true is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb was simply a symbol that they offered. And Hebrew says that surely the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could not take away uh, a guilty conscience. It only appeased God until the right time when Christ Jesus came. The point I want to make, Deborah, that I hadn't seen before is, is that, okay, everybody's trying to offer God something now. And that's what religion is. Whether it's we having a men and women day program, or, or we on a drive, or we doing this. We got some kind of activity and we trying to offer God something. But are you offering God what he asked for? And that was the problem with Cain and with Abel. 
Uh, Abel came with the blood sacrifice, while Cain came with the efforts of his hand. He was a he worked in the field, and so he brought that. But Abel brought a blood sacrifice for which God had said. And so God says in Hebrews that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith come by hearing, hearing the word of God. So if God says it's to be like this, then I have to do it the way God said it, not the way that I come up with. Well, I think that this would, this would be better. So then, Lady Deborah, uh, if I try to offer anything from myself, it's got a blemish. Because there is no man or woman that doesn't have a blemish. But Davis, even when I'm doing good, I'm still blemished because I want some credit for it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, didn't, they called everybody else's name. They didn't call my name. They, they, they don't never recognize me or whatever. It's just, it's a human being. And it's always funny to me how human beings always, as we can always see the fault in other people, but we can't see our fault. Mm -hmm. But when I see my fault and when I see that I'm blemished, I'm not perfect, that there's some fault in me, then I won't seek to offer myself to God, but I will uh, offer Christ as my substitute. And so then there's no way, that's the reason the Bible says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not hard to get saved, but, the, it, but it's hard to give up on self. I have to give up on myself first before I will accept the lamb that is without spot or wrinkle, which there is only one. And that's Christ Jesus. Amen. And so uh, as pastor, this is a good segue because we're running for a few scriptures to say the lamb is symbolic of Christ Jesus as the Passover lamb. And we can we can go to scripture and we can see that in the scriptures. So when you're talking about the Passover, we're talking about it as a day of redemption we're talking about it as a day of uh, independence, where now they get to leave uh, Egypt, where they have been held in bondage. So they get to, they're, they're free now. So this is a time that God is getting ready to institute this as, a, as, as something that they will do every year to remember where God brought you from. So now I'm getting ready to redeem you. I'm bringing you out of Egypt, and I don't want you to forget that you did it, that you didn't do it, that, that I did it. And, and Lady Deborah, what is so hurting about Christianity is, and I'm just, this, this is just coming through the last couple of, of messages, is, is that just because you get saved doesn't mean your life will change. Just because you get saved doesn't mean your life is going to change. So then when he brought them out, the blood was signifying that, that you're no longer up under this anymore. But what happens is, is that God saves us, and we go to church, and they put us up under the body of the lid. Now, all of a sudden, you can't wear this, you can't listen to this music, you, you have to do this, you have to hold your head a certain way, you have to do this. When God set us free, ain't no man can set nobody free. God is the one that set us free, but man will bring you back up under bondage. Uh, again, so the, the freedom that they had, I'm glad you brought that up, is what's missing. The freedom uh, and, and, and the guilty conscience. The guilty conscience. Until I got some of I had to say 25 years. But Mother Minnie, those whole 25 years, I was walking around with a guilty conscience. You know what I'm I still thought I wasn't good enough. I I had periods of pain when I was doing real good. Maybe I went to a revival all week and cried and, and all that stuff. During those times, I felt like, oh, boy, I'm, I'm really on path. But that was short lived yeah. Because my righteousness was not based upon what Christ did, but my righteousness was based upon what Pamela did. Yeah. And Pamela always came short. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Anybody else? Okay, let's run for a few scriptures. Let's go to Acts the eighth chapter. I really was going to have someone to read these, but the microphone is acting up, so we won't do that. I'll just, we'll just look at them. We'll f affirm that Christ is the Passover lamb. Okay? Okay, thank you, Pastor. It's going to work this time. All right. Me and you. All right. <laughs> we did get Me and you, the baby maker. Okay. Okay. Testing. All right. Y'all laughing. Abraham and Sarah and everything. We better around make a baby on y'all. Y'all say, what, Pastor Neil? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. 
get mad at me. We might make one, but I. Uh, <laughs> somebody uh, else had to raise. Down, I don't know who going to raise. Hey God, hey God, had to raise. <laughs> hey God, had to raise that rascal. I knew that's right. My nerves are bad. Ooh, Lord Jesus. Acts eight, Acts eight, okay. Acts eight, okay. Verse thirty-two through thirty-five. Okay. Acts eight. Verse thirty-two and thirty-five, through thirty-five, brother. Thirty-two through thirty-five. Uh huh. The place of the scripture. Am I right place? Yes, sir. The place of the scripture where he read was this: He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And this is from Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And now pastor's going to 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, the Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For Christ, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And I'm going to 1 Peter 18 through 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay, first Peter. Revelation. Oh, Revelation 5, mm -hmm. uh, verses 5 through 6, and then 13th chapter in the 8th verse. The Bible says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelations 13 and 8. And the Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Thank you, Pastor. And so we can see from Scripture, Scripture has verified, Scripture has substantiated that when we're talking about the Passover lamb, we're talking about Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus Christ. And we'll see from uh, how God instructed Moses to tell them of what to do concerning the blood, how that it is symbolic of Christ when he died on Calvary, how he redeemed us back. It's symbolic of it having to take blood because all we, we, we go back to the scripture in Hebrews, I believe it's the ninth chapter, where it says that we've been purged, uh, and the reason we've been purged is through the blood because uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. So anytime you talk about redemption, anytime you talk about remission, you cannot separate it from the blood of Jesus. That's why when uh, uh, Moses talked to the people, God instructed Moses, tell the people, this is what I want them to do with the blood. And so when, when uh, let's go back to Exodus, the 12th chapter. 
So the lamb, the lamb had to be chosen, a special lamb, not just any lamb, but a lamb that was without blemish. And then when they chose the lamb, they had to kind of look at the lamb for about four days and make sure that it had no blemishes on it. Now, historians say this is symbolic. When you talk about Jesus Christ being the Passover lamb, do you remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey? You remember that and when they laid out the palm leaves and they were uh, worshiping him and saying, oh, hallelujah, bless the Lord, he's coming in, you know. And then, you know, those same people turned around and said, crucify him. Well, they said all of this happened during the time that God had instituted the Passover. Actually, during the time, letting you know that he really is a true Passover lamb. So when he came into Jerusalem about that time, and, 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 and then in Exodus, it says they had to watch the lamb for four days. They had to examine the lamb for four days. Well, what happened to Jesus when they took him in? Isn't that what they did to Jesus? They, they examined him and took him from hall to hall. They watched him. They asked him questions. But they still could not come up with anything against him. He remained unblemished. In, in one sense, he was unblemished because he was sinless. In another sense, when he stood before Pilate, what did Pilate say? I find no fault. And, and so he was unblemished in that respect. Couldn't come up with anything on him. No fault. I find no fault. Let me bring me some water. Let me wash my hands. I find no fault in him. He's not blemished in any way. He hasn't done anything wrong. And so they had to watch the lamb to ensure that he met all of the specifications that God had given to Moses. And then on the 14th day of the month, at the evening, they had to slay the lamb. They slay the lamb, and God instructed them to take the blood, take the blood from the lamb, and apply the blood to the lentil. And the lentil is uh, the top right here. That's the part that supports everything else that's above it. And then to the doorpost. Apply the blood to the lentil and to the doorpost. And he said, when I see the blood, what happens? When I see the blood. I'll pass over. When I see the blood, I'll pass over. Uh, the blood is necessary. Can I tell you that you got to have the blood? You cannot have a crucifixion without the blood. We can't talk about that we saved unless we talk about the blood. We can't talk about our redemption unless we talk about the blood. Anything that we have, we have it because of the sacrifice he made on the cross because of the blood. And we were not redeemed with jewels or things that can rust or, rust or things that people can come in and take from us. We were redeemed with the precious blood, as Peter says. It's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so uh, God instituted this as the Passover. Let's go, let's look at. Uh, let's go back to chapter 12, and let's look at uh, verse 6. I'm, in, I'm sorry, Exodus 12, verse 6. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the morning. So this was intended for everyone. This was intended for everyone. And they shall take of the blood. And strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And it shall, they shall eat it. Where am I? To have not eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water. In other words, you could, don't boil it. You're not boiling it, and you're not putting water on it anyway. You're going to roast it in the fire, roast it with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertness, that's the insides of it, thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. You don't eat nothing, no excess, nothing in excess. Everything goes. 
and you, you divide it proportionately for the people in your house, you'd get just enough for the people who are in your house. Anything that's left over, you're not going to, take, you're not going to do anything with that. And thus shall you eat it, and this is how you eat it, with your lawns girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hands, and ye shall eat it in haste. Why? It's the Lord, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So he's coming through now, and he's getting ready to affect uh, 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 Pharaoh. He's getting ready to affect every household. There is not going to be one household in Egypt that will go untouched. Every household in Egypt will be affected. Well, maybe they didn't have any, any children, okay? So if they didn't have any children, they would still be affected because it's the firstborn of the beast that they had. Every household will be affected in some way. Now, it would have affected the children of Israel if they did not uh, apply the blood to their homes, as Jesus has said. So you just can't get the instructions, Pastor Bland. You got to follow the instructions. So you just can't hear what God has said. You've got to do what God has said. And so it wouldn't do any good. It's just, just like people today, Pastor, who a lot of times they'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But do you believe what he did for you and that what he did for you was sufficient enough to save you or redeem you, to buy you back? Do you, re do you believe what he did was sufficient enough to save you from your sins? It's not enough just to believe. You got to apply that to your life. What good is it if you don't apply it to your life? And so what we have to keep in mind here is that it wasn't uh, the life of the lamb that saved the people from judgment, but it was the death of the lamb. The lamb had to die. The lamb had to die. Blood had to be exacted in order to free the people, in order to be effective. Again, they had to do what had been instructed. They had to place the blood over the lintel and on the doorpost in order for it to be uh, effective. And so let's go back to uh, Exodus, the 12th chapter. The lamb was roasted and eaten, and the eating was done in haste. Because when the death angel came through, whenever God said it's time, he didn't want them to be hanging around doing nothing. What, what, they, what the old song said, when God said move, you got to move. And there's no, you know, you don't know, talking about it and wandering around and looking. He had already given them instructions. You gird up your loins. Keep your shoes on. He wouldn't even let them put yeast in the bread. You don't have time to wait around for, for the bread to rise. So you're going to eat unleavened bread. Eat unleavened bread. And so let's go back to uh, Exodus 12. And let's look at uh, verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. They still observe Passover uh, today. Today is a, it's such, a, such a, 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 a holiday. The first couple of days, they don't even go to work or do anything like that. The first couple of days of Passover. And the last two days of Passover, the holiday for them, they don't go to work then either. And so um, it says, for generations to come, and you know, there is something to be said about passing on. It says something to be said about passing on the goodness of the Lord, or passing on uh, memories, or passing on a testimony about how good God has been. 
especially to your, your people, especially to your family. Because sometimes, especially in this generation where children think they are entitled, and I don't always, you don't intend to pick on children, but this is just an example. This is just an example because certainly children are live, they think they're entitled. But in this day, when they think they are entitled, it's good for us to go back, sit them down sometime and say, honey, look, let me tell you where God brought us from. Let me tell you how good God has been. And let me tell you, you know, let's tell them, tell them sometime how you had to eat what you say, Pastor Beans and no cornbread. Tell them sometimes about how it wasn't, it hadn't been like this always. We hadn't always been able to go to the store and just throw stuff in the basket, not even considering what the bill is going to be. Keep a list. And then had to sometimes would have to go and put stuff back. You know, you get up there shame and you get to count it up. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Let me uh, or you just tell the cashier, just take that off. Take that off. Take that off. You know, and have a piece of meat every now and then. My husband would marvel at us because I said, baby, every time we ate, we didn't have meat. And we, but we, and we didn't. Not in my house, especially with 10 children. You know, that was a luxury. And then you take uh, 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 ground beef where they used to sell it three pounds for a dollar. You take that and make it last for a week. And not shameful and everything. You sit down and tell them that, baby, it hadn't been like this always. God did it. God did it. And so God wanted them to remember. You make this a memorial uh, among your people. You tell every generation that when we came out of Egypt, God brought us out with a mighty hand. When we came out of Egypt, God is the one who bore us on eagles' wings. When we came out of Egypt, God did it. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. And so God wanted them to know and wanted them to keep that as, as, as a memorial. It says, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. Now, I don't even want, want nothing around you that has the appearance that it could rise. That's a sign of impurity, and that's a sign of pride. I don't even want nothing around you. Even to this day, uh, during that time, they take out the yeast in, out of the house. They have nothing. Even if it's a, a, a drink that has yeast in it, they take it out. They take it out. No, we don't want nothing there. We want to be reminded that everything that happened to us during this time, because we were burdened down. And it's kind of like when we celebrate, uh, was it Juneteenth? No, it's for us. We can identify with this. We don't act like we don't know because we were oppressed. We were burdened down. Burdened down so the, 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 the fabric of this country was built on our backs. And so when we were free, we're happy about it. We celebrate. We celebrate. We celebrate our independence that we were free. And that we don't have to live like that anymore. Now, the children of Israel, they had short memories. They had short memories. Because even though they were celebrating, when God freed them and they were out, you know, going to where they were going to, they would always turn around and look back and say, I remember when. They would never say, I remember when I was in bondage. But they would always say, oh, we remember how the food was so much better. And we remember what, what we had. And we remember how, how, how we didn't have to want for anything. Not that we were in bondage in Egypt. And so God had to always chastise them. God had to chastise them because they had short memories or selective memories. But let's not, let us not have selective memories. Let us remember uh, what God has done. Let us continue to make it a memorial to our children. Baby, God did it. I didn't realize my time was out. But let's give the Lord a hand praise. We'll pick up here next Sunday.